Good morning from New York and welcome to the Coinbase Institutional Markets Call. My name is Ben Floyd and I will be your host for the day. As usual, we have the fantastic David, Greg, Josh and Sid joining us talking through all things markets, flow, macro and Web3 amongst other things. In addition, we have Ben Dean, Director of Digital Assets at Wisdom Tree joining us to talk about all things ETFs. We're a couple of weeks in now. How are we doing? What should we be looking forward to next? Do we see an ETF in the future? Is it going to be staking related? Are we going to use LSDs? A ton of questions we can answer later on when we get to Ben's part of the section, which I'm super, super excited about. Um, but it's been a, been a better week this last week. Price action has certainly been much, much better. Uh, I'm curious, Greg, has that fed through to client conversations? Are people feeling a little, a little better this week after uh, a little less red? Yeah, it sure has. Um, you know, and even... During the sell-off, uh, a lot of uh, you know conversations we had with you know different types of clients, whether they be venture, liquid, tradfi, you know for the most part, people remained constructive, um, and I think that's because you know this is really a longer-term story than what happened in any given week. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. I mean, I guess ninety days ago we were trading, sort of sub 30k so we've uh a lot a lot's happened in, in a short period of time i feel like in crypto we forget that sometimes but uh but good to hear people are positive um but some quick housekeeping before we get into it um if you are watching on youtube don't forget to scan the qr code to access david's research if you're listening on podcast the links will be in the show notes and don't forget to like and subscribe so others can hear about the show but without further ado, let's get right into it and take a look at the markets. Josh, over to you. Yep. Good morning, everybody. Uh, on the market side, BTC is trading 43,350 last, um, up 8.85% on the week, with ETH trailing behind with slower momentum up 3.2%, 2,000, uh, 2,313 last. Um, in the last month, it's worth noting that BTC has traded up 2.7%, ETH up 1.4% more or less trading near market levels to kick off the year prior to the BTC ETF news hitting the tape. Uh, interestingly, when we look at ETH, we continue to see weakness here relative BTC. Uh, it's underperformed by 5.2% in the last week and Solana by 14% or more than that in the last week. Um, the underperformance has been well noted by many market participants and the clients that we speak to. Uh, and whether the issue is related to a perceived lack of catalyst in the near term or if there's a preference for an all-encompassing scalable faster L1, uh, at the end of the day, it looks to me that ETH is really struggling to catch a bid, even in the face of it being seemingly uh, the next trade that we talk about following the crypto ETF pipeline narrative. Um, so it's something that we're watching for. Um, after being stuck in somewhat uh, bearish territory following its stellar run up in 2023, uh, Solana price action is back this week. It's trading up 24.8%. Uh, the catalyst that I see here is renewed interest in the ecosystem in anticipation of Jupiter's airdrop on Wednesday. Um, according to Coindesk reports, the Solana-based DEX aggregator is reportedly um, looking to had settled $500 million worth of transactions on Sunday, uh, outperforming even the likes of Uniswap, which reportedly handled $480 million that same day. Um, it's worth noting that Solana's move from you know sub $70 through $100 uh, earlier in December really came on the back of the JITO airdrop, and it appears that the market is really readying itself um, for a potential similar move here today. Very cool. And Sid, we'd love to bring you in here. I'm curious, like, what are you uh, looking out for with regards to the, the Jupiter airdrop today, or rather this week, rather? Yeah, I mean, it's what's interesting is the, the team has decided to drop a pretty significant percentage of its token supply to uh, as part of the airdrop, uh, approximately 40%, which compared to other historical airdrops, most notably uh, the Uniswap airdrop was around 15%. So this is a pretty significant a percentage of token supply specifically for the airdrop. Um, Jupiter, for context, it's regularly trading uh, in terms of uh, volumes, number two ranked to Uniswap in terms of global rankings for decentralized exchange volumes. So it, it's pretty sizable DEX. And uh, I think uh, it's really going to, it spurs the kind of Solana ecosystem even more as, the, as over the past few months, it's all been airdrops that have been fueling a lot of interest and in a lot of um, kind of retail interest in, in smaller meme coins on Solana, the, most notably the Jupiter team themselves, they facilitated the airdrop of a, a token called WEN uh, last week, uh, which again spurred Jupiter volumes regularly over $500 million per day, uh, several days of the week. Uh, and then, you know, several airdrops before that, um, uh, WIF and Bonk and so many other meme coins that have really sparked the Solana wave. 
good, good to see that things are still very serious in crypto. Um, <clears throat> Sid, I'm curious, like, what are some of the pros and cons of such a, a large airdrop? Yeah, I think the, the the pros are, you know, a lot of people have a wealth effect and, and basically develop a sort of community affinity to the product and to the project themselves and uh, become uh, pretty, uh, you know, vocal about it, uh, especially, you know, posting screenshots, etc. Uh, the cons is, of course, there's a huge influx of supply all at once. And it's kind of a game theory in terms of how it plays out. Uh, if folks believe in the kind of long-term potential of the project, they kind of tell to hold on to it. And then the team themselves, it's up to the team to introduce actual use cases uh, or benefits of holding the token, whether that's a revenue share or staking or whatever the case may be. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I feel like I haven't looked at the data, but it's, it's rare that you see an airdrop with the token trading significantly higher. Um, it, it always feels like uh, generally those that sell immediately have, have never made the worst decision in the world. Um, but anyway, I hope I hope they can they can kind of buck that trend and uh, and, and trade higher. Um, Josh, what else are you seeing? Uh, yep. So um, I know that we're going to talk a lot more here today with Ben about ETFs. Um, but in ETFs, uh, in additional news, Hong Kong-based Harvest Global um, is said to have filed for a spot BTC ETF. Um, the move is, of course, noteworthy in that Hong Kong has looked to position itself as a crypto-friendly hub. Uh, but Greg and I, we've talked about this a lot, and in my opinion, global ETFs are really I think more sentiment indicators for local regulatory bodies as it pertains to digital assets and are less meaningful from a flows perspective. Um, ETFs outside of the US, um, they're largely US-based products as evidenced by the fact that the lion's share of ETF flows are concentrated in the S&P, the NASDAQ and other uh, US-based benchmark indices. So from my perspective, it's not immediately clear to me how an ETF approval in Hong Kong, for instance, would meaningfully change the picture for crypto in the near term. Um, but from a sentiment perspective, it obviously would be good. Um, to call uh, from my seat, given some of the more recent bearish takes I've seen out there, uh, I think it's important to keep perspective that really BTC is actually performing relatively in line with risk assets with stocks also up, call it three to four percent, depending on you know which index you look at. Um, additionally, from what I see, crypto might actually be getting better at pricing events in the medium term, given that we are, as you noted, Ben, earlier, we're settling in BTC uh, following the sell the new story is really price action is exactly kind of where we left off last year. Um, so some away from some of the exuberant spikes that we saw immediately higher following the ETFs, trading in BTC, in my opinion, feels orderly and activity really, really looks to have stabilized here. Thanks, Josh. I'm, I'm curious, just going back to your comment around the, the Hong Kong-based ETF, is, is there a path where that opens up potential flows from mainland China? Um, and, and if yes, could, could that be seen as a potential positive? Yeah, I mean, I think that that, of course, is always the question is Hong Kong is a buffer zone. Um, the flows that people pay attention to for Hong Kong is as it pertains to the mainland. Um, I think, you know, you kind of have to read the tea leaves there and trying to figure out whether or not uh, what China's stance towards crypto really is. I think in general, what we would see is that, um, you know, in a totally decentralized asset like uh, like Bitcoin, it, you know, it, it seems to me um, that access to such a product you wouldn't necessarily see something like that just open the floodgates from China's perspective. Um, also, China being able to access and allowing mainland investors to access a Hong Kong based product would have to go through what's called the Stock Connect scheme. Um, so those listing requirements take a lot of time. So I imagine that, you know, at, if something were to be approved in Hong Kong, the time frame in which then uh, what's called southbound Chinese investors being able to invest in that product via the Hong Kong Stock Connect, uh, in my opinion, would be a couple of years. Got it. Super, super helpful. And and Greg, Josh mentioned kind of price action in, in Bitcoin. I know you keep a very close eye on, on basis and open interest. What's it looking like from that perspective? Uh, well, like Josh said, things have calmed down. Um, I think we have a chart we can bring up here. But, you know, I think on last week's call, we talked about how it looked like TradFi selling, uh, specifically closing, you know, long futures positions was what um, you know drove most of the sell off in Bitcoin. Um, and we kind of see that in this chart. Uh, you know, we see a peak in open interest and then it, it comes down to uh, under 4.5 billion. We've now seen open interest just stabilize and, and start to climb a little bit, um, both in dollar terms along with the price, but also in token terms. So, you know, that's a really good sign because to me, it signals that, you know, a lot of those folks that were just playing the event um, are likely gone now. Um, additionally, we're seeing basis rates are stabilizing in the positive like 10% range, 
which isn't amazing from a from a basis trade uh, standpoint, um, given all the capital that's required for that trade. Um, but it is just good to see, you know, rate stabilizing, open interest stabilizing, along with price. Interesting. And how does this connect to the ETF flows? How, what have they been looking like in the last last week or so? So yeah, if we go to the next slide, we we have those. So flows since you know the products have launched, uh, all of the spot products have in aggregate um, accumulated about a billion dollars, which is, you know, that's a lot of money. That's significant. Um, we've certainly seen a rotation out of the higher cost ETFs into the, some of the new lower cost products. Um, but we're seeing that rotation start to slow. Um, the redemptions out of GBTC, um, I think there were 200 or nearly 200 million uh, yesterday. I think 450 million uh, the trading day prior. So, you know, there's still large numbers, but they're slowing. And I think when they get to zero, that'll be important because it'll signal two things. One, all of the ARBs that were in the trade are likely gone. Um, and two, anybody that wanted to rotate into a different product um, has. And that'll, again, just be another thing that, that calms down and allows the uh, asset to trade on its own. Very cool. Thank you for breaking that down. And this is a great time to bring in Ben Dean, Director of Digital Assets at Wisdom Tree Europe. Uh, ben, welcome to the show. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. Cool. Well, very, very thankful to have you here. And I just kind of a starting question. I'm curious, how did you get into to, to crypto and, and what is your role at Wisdom Tree? The first one's a long story. Uh, Ten years ago, I lived in Venezuela. Uh, saw hyperinflation, capital controls, broken banking system, and everyone had Blackberries. So I said to myself, wouldn't it be cool and useful if you had some kind of digital money that could go on a cell phone? And it didn't take very long for me to find Bitcoin after that. So it's been about a 10-year journey. My job at Wisdom Tree as director, I get to work across the business in the United States and Europe with all of our different teams. Some days it's research, product development, it could be sales. Increasingly, it's around strategy for digital assets for all our work streams across the two sides of the business. Amazing. I think that's one of the better Genesis stories I've heard. Venezuela is, is obviously almost kind of patient zero in some ways for, 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 for Bitcoin and and very I've never been, sadly. Uh, at some point I hope to go, but it's 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 great to hear for people that have actually been there and seen it right at kind of ground zero. Um, and very cool. So your role sounds fantastic at, at Wisdom Tree, pretty very wide ranging and, and covering lots of different things. I guess the ETF has been something that's very um, front and center, I'm sure, for, for you and others uh, over the last few months and probably half a year, to be honest. Um, we're now a few weeks into Spock Bitcoin ETF launched in the US. I'm curious, like, how do you think the first few weeks have, have been in general? Well, I just echo Greg's points before. Uh, I've also noticed the rotation out of the higher priced ETFs for lower priced ones, a rotation out of futures products, which is a trend we've seen in Europe over the last 18 to 24 months. Um, and really, I, I try to take a longer term perspective. Uh, that is to say about three, six, maybe 12 months. Uh, <clears throat> rarely does somebody look at a game of football and judge the outcome of the game by the first minute. And I think it's important here that people think a little bit about the processes that have to play out uh, over the coming months for the adoption of these products to really reach saturation. The first is you have to remember that a lot of these products aren't on large distribution platforms for the moment. So while they are approved and they are effective, it doesn't mean that they're available to the full set of institutional investors who they eventually will be once integrated into those platforms. The second piece to remember is that a lot of the people who are potential customers for these products, uh, and I'm thinking especially about the advisor market, but also the platforms, uh, they were being told one year ago and the years previous that Bitcoin's bad, don't touch Bitcoin, it's used by criminals, it'll never work, it's going to zero. And six months ago, they were told by some of the largest leaders of asset managers, actually, Bitcoin's a great store of value. It's an international currency. It's a flight to quality asset. So that very sudden change of messaging uh, has caught a lot of people. Uh, they've got two narratives in their head and now they have to reconcile it before they make decisions to allocate or they recommend others make allocations. They're going to have to sit down and do what we've done for this long and let's learn a lot of details around what can be a complex and technical space. 
So that will take time. But uh, you've got to be patient. These things play out, as we've seen over the last 10 to 15 years. It does take time to play out, but it eventually does. I think that's a great point. And we are starting to see that, I mean, there's two things that still need to happen. One, there needs to be a lot more advertising and marketing of these products. And I think we're just starting to see that kickstarted um, among a lot of the issuers. And number two, uh, I think that, you know, for many of the asset managers out there, they need to start putting this in their model portfolios, which hasn't happened yet. Um, but I think that this also is going to happen probably in the next few weeks or months. Uh, so that's going to be important. But you know, we've been talking a lot about Bitcoin. Um, one thing, though, that we kind of mentioned early in the show is that ETH has actually not caught the same bid uh, as Bitcoin. And it's kind of been this kind of crypto natives looking for like, you know, further out the risk curve into all coins. Uh, some of the institutional players kind of entering the space for the first time, first time anchoring on Bitcoin. But ETH has gone somewhat unloved. Some of that has been technical. Uh, you know, you saw some liquidations from Celsius, for example. There's now a large option to writer uh, who, who's also kind of putting pressure on the spot. But, I mean, overall, we have this spot ETH ETF that's coming. Um, I, I'm kind of curious, Ben, like, what do you think is, like, wh why do you think that the, the, we haven't already seen kind of more attention being drawn to that and that attracting some of the flows? It might be your target market. In Europe, over the last couple of years, I've been even somewhat surprised to see how muted the inflows into Ether have been from institutional investors. Uh, remember, just a couple of years ago, I would turn up at client meetings with a deck with a kind of heat map of the digital asset ecosystem. And I would say, did you know there's more than Bitcoin? Roughly 60% of the market is X Bitcoin. And people would look at me and say, no, <laughs> what's Ether? Um, that probably hasn't changed in a lot of parts of that institutional segment of the market. Um, Ether is a very different value proposition. You know, we know about kind of the supply demand dynamics around burning and uh, staking, as, of course. So it's a more complicated, different value proposition and investment case that just isn't very well known. Uh, so, again, I would expect that to change over time. But if the market echoes what we've seen in Europe over the last few years, uh, and it is a different market, it wouldn't surprise me to see kind of a muted start if these pr products were to be approved. And, you know, something I'm thinking about in terms of like the kind of we, what we're seeing with Bitcoin is this rebalancing of flows, right? But you don't have that in the same way with ETH necessarily, right? I mean, you have, you know, futures ETH uh, ETFs in the US, but you really don't have the same kind of like equity kind of uh, proxies that you have in Bitcoin. How does that kind of affect your thinking with regards to ETH? Because on the one hand, you're right, it's a different mode of thinking to invest in ETH. On the other hand, you know, you, you're limited in terms of your ability to express any interest in ETH and the Web3 ecosystem. So, I mean, how, how does that affect your thinking? It's an interesting question. It's true that there aren't as many kind of proxies that one can use to get exposure to Ether as one can and has done to get to Bitcoin. One thought that goes through my head is the kind of if you build it, will they come dynamic, which is why hasn't that emerged? Why hasn't somebody found a way to build such a proxy? Um, is there no demand for it? Is it so too, is it too early or do they literally not exist? Uh, I don't have an answer for you on that one, but it is an, a thought-provoking question. The other dimension to perhaps think about is the staking dimension. A big part of the value proposition for holding Ether is that one can stake it in return for the staking yield. Now, that's different, to, difficult to integrate into uh, an ETP structure. It can be done, but it's not that easy. And so, again, part of the value proposition might simply not be there if these kinds of products were approved. Uh, at any point in time in the near future. But we do have, you know, ETP products, ETH ETP, ETH ETP products. I can't say that 10 times fast. <laughs> uh, we have ETH ETP products in Europe that already include staking. So it doesn't yes. seem like it's a procedural issue or, or, or is it? I mean, you, you know the details of this far better than I do. Can you just kind of walk us through that? Yes, uh, some of it is operational. Uh, which is just making sure that you've got kind of the setup in place with the validator node, um, that you've got kind of minimize your slashing or penalty risk. Um, a big part of it, though, is managing liquidity. Uh, one of the unique characteristics of the way Ether stakings works is there's kind of this queue to get in and queue to get out of staking. And that's there for security reasons. 
Um, those lines going in or out can accumulate quickly, and we have seen historically they've been up to 30 days. Now, if one wants to redeem from an ETP that holds Ether that is staked, and that line, everyone rushes towards the uh, figurative uh, cinema door when somebody else fire. If everyone rushes towards the door, then you can't get the liquidity, you can't get it back within the T plus two window. And so for that reason, like liquidity has to be managed in quite a fine tuned way. And that in and out door for, for th staking has to be monitored very closely. Uh, that's just a few like technical and operational issues that have to be dealt with. But they are things that must be considered in order to give institutional grade products that are reliable, transparent and safe for people to use. So, so practically, Ben, how does that look? Is that potentially using liquid staking derivatives or is that staking 90% of the AUM and having 10% in ETH? So you're not getting your full staking rewards, but you've got withdrawal limits around the 10% range. Like, what, what are some of the practical ways that people might look to solve that problem? A lot of people would like to go to liquid staking tokens. The issue there is that a lot of exchanges don't accept tokens. Um, it's kind of an artifact of the way in which they used to place a criteria on what could or couldn't be listed. They'd say cryptocurrencies can, but crypto tokens like Uniswap or um, Lido, they cannot. Um, so without that piece in place, you, you can't really use liquid staking tokens to solve the problem. Uh, the latter solution you said is around managing the amount staked. And in, for that, you've got to work out kind of the distribution of different holders of the product. If more than 50% is held by one entity, then uh, well, you, you can either make sure they understand if they unstake that there might be issues. Um, if it's quite heterogeneous, then it's kind of you can ratchet it up uh, a bit more than you might otherwise. But uh, still, I, I, I would think getting to 90%, depending on the size of the fund and the, the distribution of the holders, I haven't seen that done yet, and it seems to be operationally a, a bigger challenge than perhaps, say, 20 or 30 percent. So, so this is something that I'm not clear on as far as, I guess, the legal or regulatory kind of concerns around it. And I'm not sure if it's the same in, the, in Europe as it is in the U.S., but um, for ETFs, do these products need to offer redemptions within a specific period of time? Like, for example, if unstaking takes a little bit longer uh, than a few days, for example, would that violate any regulatory issues? Does it need to be T plus two, for example? Usually that information would be contained in the prospectus and would be described in detail. And that's where people need to go and look uh, to get a, a feel for what that answer is. Always look at the prospectus. I mean, th there's a lot of difference between these products. Um, in both sides of the Atlantic, and you really have to go and look at the fine details. It's not just the fees that, that people have to look at. It's things like the custodial setup, like the redemption creation process, um, who the authorized participants are. Um, those are the kinds of like details that, have, that people should look into and aren't necessarily, necessarily regulatory requirements, though they can be in some cases. Interesting. So switching gears a little bit, how about Solana? Like there's a few people that are probably bullish on Solana in general talking about Sol Futures, which is potentially then leads to a Sol ETF. Um, how, how are you thinking about that as a structure and, and whether or not that's possible? So uh, Solana has been a surprising case, at least in European ETP flows over the last year. We did see more go into Solana than Ethereum, for instance. Um, I think that's driven a little bit by just frankly, the, the price action. Also, there are some products in Europe that have staking enabled for Solana, which uh, makes them kind of a more interesting investment proposition than just getting one without the staking. Um, we'll see how that evolves in, in the other parts of the world. Though Solana's resilience has surprised even me after going through another brutal crypto winter, that's usually the test where you find out which networks can survive or not. And sure enough, Solana has I guess because it's a value proposition is fast transactions that are cheap cost. That still seems to be a valid value proposition and there are people out there interested in it. Um, I am waiting to see what applications have rolled out on Solana to kind of drive demand for that token, or cryptocurrency. Circle's interactions with um, Solana on their USDC, uh, US peg, dollar peg token is one I've got my eye on. So monitor that space and see how it goes. Something will happen. 
Yeah, and so you mentioned applications there. Uh, I guess within Ethereum, you've got DeFi, you've got potential tokenization. Uh, within Solana, you've got DeepIn, you've got NFTs, and the, the, the Venn diagrams do overlap across all of those different segments as well. What use cases excite you for the next 12 months? What are some things you're keeping a really close eye on? I'm interested in this tokenization trend. I'm interested in anything where you can take economic interactives that are productive and then bring them on into an on-chain environment. Uh, the reason I'm interested in that is because we've already seen it with these kind of, with Tether and with Circle, that there is a market for US dollar peg tokens out there in various parts of the world. Uh, we're starting to see it with different tokenized assets like gold. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of space there to run with, but one has to change the way one looks at the space. It's not so much about, you know, how much has the price of Ether gone up today? It's more looking at the Ethereum network, for instance, as a piece of digital infrastructure. And ultimately the thing that should drive demand for the Ethereum cryptocurrency is that people want to use the network to do something, ideally economically productive, not just uh, YOLOing on stuff. <laughs> So uh, I've got my eye on that particular area, what people call tokenization, uh, but I'm sure there are, there are other ones out there that are equally interesting to look at. It's just there's only so many hours in a day and so many things to look at. So it does seem like a lot of this stuff is happening on public rails, and I think uh, Ethereum and Stellar seem to be like the large two networks that seem to be attracting uh, attention as far as tokenization is concerned. And I think uh, you know we saw tokenized treasuries and, and those kind of products like 7X, or of course, 2023. So you're right. Th this is not insubstantial. This is like a huge opportunity in a huge market. Uh, but there's still so much uh, happening on private rails. And, you know, like you being a wisdom tree, I'm sure you have a lot of insight into this. I mean, what's the path to get us from that into like more public secondary markets? Because unfortunately, I feel like there's a lot of liquidity trapped there at the moment that, you know, it's, it's burdened not just by regulatory equivalency, but also by just the, the technical kind of developments here because some of these stacks are being built on Hyperledger, others are being built on Canton, you know, like they don't talk to each other. So what's the path forward? Yeah, I was hoping, you know, remember that phase maybe eight years ago when people would say, you know, blockchain, not Bitcoin and, and private permission rails kind of thing, which is a database. Um, what I was hoping is over time they would drop that and realize that kind of the open networks uh, that are interoperable, that is, they're all on the same standard. Uh, was what people would settle on. That has happened to some degree, though the controls that are required are put on at the, the smart contract layer, not at the protocol layer, which is good. Um, the counter narrative there is what you've identified, and that's large institutions creating their own network. And from what I've observed, they, they have now run into the precise problem that you've pointed out. They can't speak to one another. So I have seen proof of concepts out there using things like um, layer zero, uh, in attempt to kind of make this interoperability or bridging between networks. And uh, that introduces a new piece into the technical puzzle, which I don't know how feasible or scalable it is, but they've certainly realized that problem's there. I think it's just a matter of time until they realize that everything they want from these networks can be done at the, uh, at the open network level using zero knowledge proofs, where they can keep the privacy, where they have controls in the smart contract uh, itself. And then you don't have to worry about interoperability or running your own network. Uh, you can use this as a common public good, which is uh, kind of how email works or TCP IP. Um, so there's this precedence in history, but intranet was a thing. Remember David, <laughs> <laughs> we're all building our own intranets. Uh, and then we saw how that worked out. It's just a matter of time and I'm glad to see them progressing, but it's taking longer than I would like. That's right. I, I can. <laughs> that's a really good point, actually. Uh, what do you think we're going to see for tokenization in 2024? Uh, well, what I'm observing is it's in, in it's emerging in different jurisdictions, and that would be tied, I think, deeply to the regulatory um, framework in place in that jurisdiction. One of the funny things about this is you have these global uh, networks, right? That that aren't really location. They're close location agnostic. And that runs into regulatory systems that are set up at the nation state level. Um, and so you end up with kind of tension between the two. There are certain jurisdictions where we've seen the frameworks change, put into place and are more conducive. 
Luxembourg is one, Switzerland, Singapore. I'm starting to observe it in, in the European Union, in France and Germany, but it's a bit trickier with the German E-Security Act. Um, so I would expect to see more experiments popping up in different countries, but they'll be constrained by the jurisdiction in which they operate. Uh, it's going to make a lot of lawyers very busy sorting this out. It's a shame because <laughs> the technology is there and you can put in place the compliance KYC AML and investor protections you need at a technical level, in fact. Uh, it's going to take a little bit for that message to kind of bubble through its the various apparatuses. But I would look at that. And that will mean a variety of assets being tokenized beyond just US dollars, T-bills, and gold. Uh, so let's see how that plays out. So got yeah. it. Quit my job and get a law degree. Got it. No, David. <laughs> Don't give up. We need people like you on this. <laughs> never never bet against the lawyers. They, they, they find a way of winning every single angle. Um, but while also doing a great job, our legal team here is amazing. So thank you. Um, but uh, Ben, that is uh, that was great. Thank you so much for joining. Um, ton to to think through there. And I think as you rightly, rightly pointed out, we've got a very interesting year ahead. Um, whether it's ETF related, whether it's securitization. Um, so yeah, a lot to look forward to. And and hopefully we will have you back on again soon. But thank you so much for joining. Thanks to you. Cool. So, David, talking on the macro side of things, a uh, big week this week. Um, can you run us through it and, and what else you're looking at? Yeah. I mean, everyone's waiting to see what the Fed's going to say, not because they're going to make any decision as far as monetary policy is concerned, but really we want to get insight into what they see for the macro landscape and how soon they could actually start cutting rates. And I think March is still in the picture. I don't think that's gone away entirely. Uh, but certainly, you know, we're seeing right now that in the economic data itself, you know, like there are very few trade offs as far as economic growth and inflation are concerned. Um, if anything, it seems very much that the Fed's getting everything they wanted. So the, the question is, why do they need to touch this if they don't have to? You know, like core PCE, for example, is pretty much in line with their expectations. At the same time, we're getting a lot of growth. And we know what the reasons are for that. And we mentioned it on this call before a lot of it has to do with the pro cyclical government spending that we saw in 2023, um, or at least the effects of it. So it's not as if I, I think the uh, benefits aren't, you know, well known. Uh, but what we can expect is that we will see uh, economic activity start to moderate in the course of 2024. Now, I do think that the chances of us kind of avoiding a recession are still fairly high. Um, and I don't think that that's going to at all deter the disinflationary trend we're on. In fact, I think there's a lot of concerns surrounding what's been happening in uh, the Red Sea, for example, in terms of shipping and how those could affect costs. And I, that's kind of misguided, to be quite honest with you. Like shipping costs I actually form a very small part of the overall cost of goods. Um, it's just that what we saw during the pandemic, we over-indexed to in our own brains because, you know, we saw that happen and made us concerned. But really the effect there had to do more with kind of the producers of these goods, not necessarily with the shipping of the goods because we saw a pullback on that which then, of course, was directly tied to the pandemic. So I think really we need to be looking abroad to China to understand what's happening in that situation. And, of course, things there don't look great. Um, you know, China put out some stimulus in terms of uh, the uh, RRR like cut uh, last week. And, you know, this is important. Um, but still, I think the concern coming from a lot of market players is that they're not doing enough. Um, and... You know, I think it might be per perversely kind of good for the rest of the world, perversely good for the U.S. as far as inflation is concerned. Um, in fact, like I wouldn't even be surprised if that disinflationary trend takes us like, you know, not just a target, but possibly even below, which is not a scenario many of us are thinking about right now. But I think that this is something the Fed could be considering at the moment. So uh a lot to kind of think about here right now. But I will say that overall, even though I'd say we're cautiously optimistic on the macro environment, which is good for crypto and risk assets in general, um, it's it's not a comfortable feeling at the moment. Yeah, it definitely, it definitely feels like just looking at digital assets, that grind higher um, is, is kind of the pain trade. People are lightly positioned. And to your point there, they're kind of not as comfortable in their longs, but it continues to grow higher, grind higher, and, and you get even more uncomfortable not being long enough, potentially. 
Um, but just wanted to double down on your comments around China and, and them easing. Um, how, how do you think that potentially affects uh, digital assets or, or maybe not at all? No, it's important. And I think that what you need to see is the picture holistically, right? There are far fewer alternatives for Chinese citizens to actually uh, put their money. You know, like the property sector has pretty much imploded. Um, that's not a place that people feel comfortable putting their money anymore. Um, and they need to find alternative stores of value. So I think that this is kind of what positions crypto more interestingly. Of course, we know that the Chinese government uh, has wanted to maintain uh, tight controls over capital and where it goes, and they perhaps haven't had the most favorable of kind of um, abuse on crypto, crypto as a digital uh, or uh, crypto as an asset class as a whole. So I think that that could be changing. Um, maybe what's happening in Hong Kong is representative of that. So I think that's going to be interesting. But yeah, I, I think the challenge right now is the property market's not coming back. Very few people wanting to like pursue new mortgages, wanting to buy a new property. Even more than that, the property developers are building out on the you know, the contracts that they had in previous years, but they're not taking in new capital. Um, so I think this is a really important part of the China story at the moment. Interesting. Yeah, it, it feels like the 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 Evergrande liquidation is one of those things that we've seen coming for like eighteen months, and and like now only now is is kind of reaching a, an end potentially. Um, but that, that's but, in the Hong Kong like uh, courts as well. That still needs to be like uh, adjudicated in the Chinese courts, which is different. Interesting. In fact, can you break that down for me. What's the how how, how does that differ, and and what is the kind of the process there? It's really about how they can get claims uh, to some of these uh, property developers. And, uh, you know, like, I think the court in China operates by kind of different modes of thinking uh, as compared to like Hong Kong. So it doesn't necessarily apply, but we will see right now whether the decision from the Hong Kong court transfers over uh, to the Chinese courts. And that's what's going to be significant as far as restructuring is concerned. Got it. Okay. Super, super helpful. Okay. One to, uh, one to keep an eye on. Um, now moving on to flows. Thank you very much for that, David. Greg, we, we touched on ETF flows a little bit at the top of the call, but what else are we seeing uh, on, the, on the exchange? If we zoom out um, and look at just broader exchange flows, uh, we can see here on this chart, and I'll describe it for you know, those on the podcast. Um, you know, since the week of the ETF launch, uh, spot crypto volumes have really fallen off and haven't uh, recovered much. You know, I would have expected uh, them to at least start to trend up uh, as we've seen price action move up, but we're not seeing that, which is a little discouraging. Uh, that being said, in, you know, almost all of my client conversations, uh, again, kind of across uh, the different client segments, everybody keeps using the same word, which is constructive. Um you know, they're kind of looking past the next few weeks or even month um, into early spring, summer, and, the, and then the rest of the year. So uh, from that standpoint, you know, that makes me constructive. And, um, you know, we'll have to see kind of how things shake out. I'm, cu I'm curious, what, what are some of the things that you're on your radar that would change that view? So, um, yeah, it's a good, good question. It's something we think about a lot um, from a macro standpoint. You know, I keep hearing that, uh, you know, we have these macro tailwinds, uh, which we do. Um, however, there's a few things that could derail that. Uh, one of them being inflation uh, is surprises to the upside, stays stickier, and we don't get the rate cuts that we're kind of all betting on um, later this year. I think that would be probably the, the biggest risk. And then, you know, around ETH, I'm obviously uh, an ETH bull. Um, uh, I think it, it it will likely perform well, um, or at least I, I hope it will, um, as we're in the kind of the mid cycle here. Uh, and we have conversations with a lot of clients around the, you know, ETH ETF and how that looks very similar to the Bitcoin ETF. Um, but, you know, I'm not so sure that an Ethereum ETF would be as impactful for our markets. I think it would be great that it would bring more folks into crypto. Um, but 
Ethereum is very different than Bitcoin. Bitcoin to me is digital gold. It has a place, a very clear place in uh, a tr more traditional portfolio. Ethereum is, you know, I buy it because I need it to transact on chain. Um, I can't do that if it's in an ETF. Um, it's also more of a technology play. And in a more traditional portfolio, it's going to compete with other technology plays like Microsoft, Google, NVIDIA. And I'm not sure, you know, how many flows it, it'll actually attract, you know, in the days, weeks and months uh, after a launch. Yeah, it'd be interesting to do a, um, a valuation comparison for ETH fees versus market cap and kind of like a, a price to sales, if you like, um, versus some of the, the, the mega caps. Uh, that's awesome. Thanks so much for that rundown, Greg. Now, I'm curious how we're thinking about ETH, -E, given what happened with GBTC and that discount closing. Is there still a trade to be had on the ETH -E side of things? So ETH is something we look at uh, quite a bit. And, um, you know, it's really the TradFi community that's that's reexamining this trade. And right now it's trading at about a 10, 11 percent discount, um, which, you know, is significant if you were to compare that to, say, uh, a merger arbitrage discount um, or some other event in TradFi. Uh, however, it's not at the wide levels that really we saw in the GBTC product only, you know, a few months before we were likely to get a, um, a spot ETF there. So at these levels, I would say it's not uh, an incredibly attractive trade, even after you factor in um, any gains you would make from hedging it, say with short futures, uh, those obviously traded a premium. So, so you will pick up a little bit of juice there. Uh, but for the most part, most people that I talk to that are looking at the trade are waiting to see if it widens at all back out to say 15%. Um, that's where it really kind of gets more attractive. Awesome. Very good. Thank you, Greg. Sid, moving on to Web3. Quite a few bits happening this week with airdrops and, uh, and new launches. And I know you were at a Telegram conference last week. So let's kick off there. I'm curious, how, how was that? And, and what's going on in that ecosystem? Yeah, it was uh, extremely interesting. There's, you, you know, Telegram is a, you know, it's the fourth largest messaging app in the world after, you know, WhatsApp, WeChat, Facebook Messenger, uh, like close to a billion uh, monthly active users. It's a pretty large app, but there's not much chatter in terms of its blockchain network, the Ton network, especially amongst uh, the crypto Twitter community uh, that we usually see. Um, and and it was very interesting to go to this event. It was a Ton community event here in London, uh, where uh, they kind of had a chat with uh, one of the developers of an app called the Notcoin, uh, which uh, is the most popular game on this Ton network, uh, where it's gotten 20 million um, players uh, on this game. And they launched at the start of this year, the 1st of January, 2024. So it's a pretty significant numbers. They're really trying to leverage the, the community that already exists in chats on Telegram every day by adding a kind of app store experience with uh, Web3 dApps that integrate natively with the Ton blockchain. Uh, and the Notcoin is simply a game where you just literally just tap a button to mint Notcoins. And, uh, you know, there's memes and things of that nature of cats and things of that, animals just tapping on the, on this button on the Telegram app. Um, and uh, and what's interesting is, 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 is the kind of network effect that's building around it. You know, users are getting onboarded to the ecosystem and then they kind of stick around. They have a native wallet on Ton and uh, potentially new apps and experiences can be built natively within the within that app store. Sid, come on. The not coin clicking on a button. Help me understand why that is adding any value. So I'm, I'm not sure if that particularly adds value <laughs> per se uh, in and of itself, but it's an onboarding mechanism, right? It's Appreciate a simple, it. easy, memeable onboarding mechanism to get folks on chain without realizing they're on chain because it's just okay. a fun game. It looks and feels like a candy crush kind of experience, very colorful, lots of colors and, you know, animations popping up on the screen, it takes up the whole screen, but you can access it via Telegram and that's the onboarding mechanism. And you don't know you're using a blockchain under the hood. You're just getting this in-game currency called Notcoin. Um, okay, cool. Uh, and then what, so I, I'm going to try this later and I'll report back next week. So I, I, I press some buttons, I get my Notcoin and then what do I do with my Notcoin? For now, nothing. Uh, it's it you know it just uh, you know makes the appearance of the game grow more advanced as you level up. 
it's kind of a leveling up thing. Uh, but you know, the, the developer was there in the event. It was a single single solo dev um, just that has built this and gained such a large user base so quickly because it's one of the first apps on this on the on the blockchain. Um, but uh, but the plans is to use the token within DeFi, have it be more composable, etc. So have it be an open token. Cool. Awesome. Well, one to, one to check out. Um, and what, what else is happening in, in Web3 world? Uh, the other really interesting thing that's um, uh, happened this week was the launch of uh, Forecaster Frames. So uh, so just for context, Forecaster is a decentralized social network protocol uh, that uh, basically offers an open social graph. And it's uh, where the accounts are uh, live on layer two on on optimism uh, on top of Ethereum, so they have uh, you know EVM accounts, but you can sign in. You get a social profile. It's, it's similar to Twitter kind of experience uh, where anyone can kind of build a client on top of the open social graph. And um, what frames are is basically something. It's actually an experiment that Facebook tried uh, way back in the day. Uh, it was called. It was relying on a standard called the open graph which is where people can specify tags on the, on the HTML web page of a website. At the top of the web page, you can specify some tags and it will render the content in, of, a, of a web page in a social feed. Uh, so what developers are doing is rendering all sorts of web content on the social feed of Farcaster. This includes stuff like you know literal games, uh, app experiences, uh, check out yesterday there was someone who published a uh, an, an ordering of cookies experience, cookies.xyz, where folks could order cookies from the Forecaster app. Uh, here, for folks viewing this um, uh, uh, via visuals, you can see that someone made a Pokemon game that you can play within the Forecaster social feed. Uh, all this basically to, to say that Frames as a, as a concept has kind of really opened up the flywheel in terms of developer experimentation on the platform, and it's potentially a new user experience uh, that crypto hasn't really necessarily seen before uh, and uh, could really drive a lot of new interfaces to interact with different dApps. And uh, as a result of this, Farcaster's daily active users has really spiked for you know multiple consecutive days now. It's been over 10, 15, 16K users a day, and it's continuing to grow pretty dramatically. Uh, so potentially this is like, this kickstarts a kind of new wave. The developer enthusiasm is definitely there. Um, so we'll see what kind of experimentation is done. What's really unique about this that's different to any other, you know, web app is that it's natively linked to your Farcaster EVM account. So you could mint NFTs, you could check out for products. If you see a uh, something that you want to buy, you could just, you click a button and you it automatically links to your wallet and natively takes crypto from you. So um, that kind of experience is much smoother and it's within the context of a social feed so you can flow with conversations and then also have the financial aspect uh, embedded within it. Well, that, that chart is, is pretty amazing, just uh, seeing the kind of aggressive up and to the right move for Farcast uh, uh, devs. So I'm curious, I know there was a hackathon last week that Farcast hosted and they also have a conference, I believe, in, in uh, on the West Coast later this year. Is that whole ecosystem really kind of gathering steam in, in general? Hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, so, a lot of this is due to uh, a confluence of factors. One is um, the infrastructure that's been built underneath the surface during the past year, two years, where you know only the accounts are stored on chain with Optimism, and then the rest is off chain. So it's pretty smooth, very fast. And then when they release these new features, like Frames, for example, a few days ago, um, it just kind of opens up a new interface for developers to play around with DApp. So it's a mix of on chain native combined with social. Uh, and yeah, with the hackathon and with the conference that's coming up in LA in May, um, quite a lot of developer interest already. Uh, and and what it seems like, at least from my time on the community, is, is it's a kind of very uh, talented developer base that's very enthusiastic. Uh, we've had so many of these frames shipped in the last couple of days. Um, for context, a lot of the Farcaster team and also several of the infrastructure players in Farcast are also ex-Coinbase folks. So very, very big, uh, you know, brain quotient within the ecosystem. <laughs> we're, not, we're not biased at all when we say that, but, um, but, but I agree. Um, Dan, uh, Dan is, here, is is a very smart guy and thinks about things very well. Um, cool, Sid, that's another one to test out. I have to say I'm slightly more bullish in testing out uh, or reopening my Farcaster account than I am um, the, the not button, but maybe I'm just missing the mean value here, which is quite possible. Um, awesome. Well, thank you so much for that rundown. And thank you, everyone, for dialing in today. 
um, and for uh, joining us. We will see you next week. Take care.